Welcome to this Federalist Society Faculty Book Podcast, discussing Professor Lewis Price Foley's new book, The Tea Party, Three Principles. Thank you for tuning in. As publisher Cambridge University Press states, in The Tea Party, Three Principles, constitutional law professor Elizabeth Price Foley takes on the mainstream media's characterization of the American Tea Party movement, asserting that it has been distorted in a way that prevents meaningful political dialogue and may even be dangerous for America's future. Foley sees the Tea Party as a movement of principles over politics. She identifies three core principles of American constitutional law that bind a decentralized, wide-ranging movement, limited government, unapologetic U.S. sovereignty, and constitutional originalism. These three principles, Foley explains, both define the Tea Party movement and predict its effects on the American political landscape. Foley explains the three principles' significance to the American founding and constitutional structure. She then connects the principles to such current issues as health care reform, illegal immigration, the war on terror, and internationalism. Professor Foley, a professor of law at Florida International University School of Law, is joined by critical commenter Jared Goldstein, a professor at Roger Williams University School of Law, to discuss the book. As always, the Federalist Society takes no position on particular legal or public policy issues. All expressions of opinion are those of the speakers. And now, Professors Foley and Goldstein. Hi, this is Elizabeth Foley, and I'm delighted to have the opportunity to talk about my new book today. The title of the book is The Tea Party, Three Principles. And I wanted to talk a little bit about why I wrote this book, because I think the story is kind of interesting, and it may give potential readers a perspective on what the book is about. As you can probably surmise, I'm a constitutional law professor. I've been teaching con law for over 15 years now. And I started to get a lot of questions about the Tea Party from my law students. And then it sort of snowballed from there. And I had all of these curious neighbors and friends asking me about the Tea Party, I think because they knew that I taught constitutional law. So I started looking into the Tea Party movement. And frankly, I was surprised at what I found because what I found was that the Tea Party is a movement that's centered on several sort of foundational constitutional principles. And specifically in this book, I identify three constitutional principles that seem to be of critical importance to the Tea Party movement. And those three principles are, number one, limited government. Number two, what I call an unapologetic defense of U.S. sovereignty. And number three, uh, adherence or a belief in constitutional originalism, interpreting the Constitution in the way that the, the founding generation meant it to be. And so I, I was fascinated by this discovery that the, the common thread of the Tea Party movement was actually constitutional in nature. And it was surprising because this wasn't what anyone was focusing on, at least not in mainstream media reports. They were focusing on things like the demographics of the Tea Parties or the racial composition of them in particular got a lot of attention by all kinds of pundits. And the common theme was that the Tea Party movement was being portrayed as a bunch of sort of angry old white men. And even more sort of interesting, they portrayed this anger as sort of stemming from the fact that our president was black and that the country was becoming increasingly racially mixed. So it surprised me because no one even seemed interested in listening to the Tea Party substantive complaints and the things that the Tea Party itself said that they were rallying against, things like bailouts, health care reform, immigration, the war on terror, things like that. So I started listening and talking to the Tea Partiers themselves, and I became so impressed with their earnestness in studying the Constitution in the founding era they would come up to me after I would give a talk and they would have a dog-eared constitution. It would be sort of highlighted and underlined. And they wanted to know more about what the constitution meant. So as you can imagine, this was sort of music to a geeky law professor's ears. (laughs) So, you know, my own law students weren't even that interested in the constitution in the founding era. Not that I'm disparaging them, they're great. But even law students When they're in law school, the entirety of their understanding of our Constitution generally comes from a monolithic four-hour, one-semester course in constitutional law. And in that constitutional law course, 
the primary focus is on Supreme Court case law. So we read a bunch of Supreme Court cases all day. And so there's incredibly little attention or time paid to original founding era materials, much less the text of the Constitution itself. And it's these exact sources, the text of the Constitution and these founding era sources that the Tea Partiers are reading and they want to discuss. So they strike me as a bunch that's sort of hungry to understand their own government, their own constitution, and that's something that's not just healthy and it's admirable, but it's something that's really, really needed in this country. But let me say that I will admit up front, okay, that the Tea Partiers don't always understand the finer nuances of the original materials that they study. They don't have a full-time law professor to guide them. But they understand it better oftentimes than most Americans, even college-educated Americans, and often even better than the average lawyer whose only exposure to constitutional law is from this con law course that I've described, which often has little or no original source materials in it. So the bottom line for me is that this country can't work well if we're not educated and engaged on important constitutional issues of the day. And we should, more importantly, never disparage any citizens who try to understand their constitution or who try to defend its original meaning. So I wrote this book because, to me, it's an intellectual defense of the Tea Party movement. It's not like other books who talk about who they are, their demographics, how they're funded, how they're organized, how to start your own Tea Party chapter. This book is different because it focuses on what does the Tea Party stand for, what unifies them substantively. And I don't mean to suggest either that there aren't other issues of concern to Tea Partiers across the country or that they're in lockstep all the time, but there are discernible, common, core constitutional principles for which the Tea Party stands, and I think these are constitutional principles that are still important and worth defending. So I hope that anyone who's ever had curiosity about the Tea Party movement can pick up this book and learn something doesn't matter whether they're a layperson or a lawyer, and that by reading this book, they'll better see this movement not as a movement about politics, but a movement about principles, uniquely American principles that I think are worth debating and discussing. And I look forward to hearing what Professor Goldstein has to say. This is Jared Goldstein. I'm a constitutional law professor at Roger Williams University School of Law. And I also want to thank the Federal Society for inviting me to participate in this and to thank Elizabeth Foley for her book. Like Ms. Foley, I became fascinated by the Tea Party movement as a movement about the Constitution. It's rare in American politics to have a movement that's so centrally focused, spend so much time talking about the Constitution. So I became interested in it. And Ms. Foley's book does a great service for those of us who are studying the Tea Party movement from the outside because it provides a valuable resource that clearly expresses what many Tea Partiers believe about the Constitution. That is, it explains how people inside the movement conceive their project. And I find that extremely valuable. From the outside, though, I don't believe that the principles and their elaboration by Ms. Foley begin to explain the move. That is, to my mind, the explanation given in the book is exactly backwards. Tea Partiers have strong and deeply felt views about America, and the Tea Party movement gives them a patriotic and constitutional language to express it. The Constitution part, though, is not really doing the work of the movement. It's just the language or the rhetoric they use to express their understanding of what America is and is not. Now, I know Ms. Foley doesn't think that demographics matter here, but I think it is worth pointing out that the Tea Party movement is composed of mostly people who are above average in income, who are overwhelmingly white, and who live in the suburbs. They are not generally the people in need of government programs like food stamps or assistance in getting access to health care or help in keeping their homes. And they tend to see those who use these programs as undeserving and believe that government programs like that do nothing more than steal money from hardworking Americans like themselves and give it to lazy people and moochers. Tea Partiers tend to be older Americans who who do need other governmental programs like Medicare and Social Security, and they see the recipients of those programs as deserving, and they've not challenged those government programs. But looking at each of the principles Ms. Foley identifies in the book, she identifies three principles as central to the Tea Party ideology. First, limited government as a central principle seems that to me that the assertion that only Tea Partiers are for limited government is just a straw man, because liberals and progressives that Tea Partiers hate do not actually espouse unlimited government. 
Each group just emphasizes different limits. As used by Tea Party supporters, limited government is just a label to distinguish the things that they like the government to do from the things that they don't. Programs that they like, like national defense or immigration control and possibly social security and Medicare, are appropriate, even necessary government action. But the programs they don't like violate the principle of limited government. So the notion of limited government as an organizing principle doesn't begin to explain why Tea Party supporters favor strict limits in some areas and not others. And the same is true with the second principle that Ms. Foley identifies, national sovereignty. It's a straw man to suggest, as Ms. Foley writes, that Tea Partiers believe in national sovereignty, while liberals want international institutions to control America. There are differences in the degree to which each group supports working with international partners or espouses an isolationist or go-it-alone approach. And as for the third principle, originalism, that Ms. Foley writes is central to Tea Partiers, it also doesn't begin to explain the movement. Tea Partiers see in the Founding Fathers all the values that they already hold dear. That is, they project onto the Founding Fathers their own belief and see the Founding Fathers as a group of anti-tax, anti-big government, free market entrepreneurs who hated socialism, who were devout Christians, and so forth. They project their own values onto the founders and say that they are just being true to them. And they do the same thing with the Constitution. They read the Constitution to confirm their own views. And so the language of originalism gives Tea Party supporters a language to hide their values. So in saying what the government can and can't do, we're not implementing our own values, they say. We're just following the blueprint written by the founders. For instance, they say that the Constitution prevents the government from interfering in the market in various ways. But as Justice Holmes says in his dissent in Lochner, the Constitution does not enact Mr. Herbert Spencer's social statics. It does not resolve once and for all what kind of economic regulations we should have. It allows those decisions to be made through the democratic process. But Tea Partiers don't like this. Instead of debating cap and trade or government stimulus efforts or health care reform on the merits, they use constitutional and patriotic language to say that these matters have already been decided. They are out of bounds because the founders made it so. They try to move the debate from policy to patriotism. So if these three principles do not truly explain the Tea Party ideology, what does? From my examination, the Tea Party movement is best understood as a nationalist movement motivated by a specific and narrow vision of what America is. Ms. Foley acknowledges this to a certain extent in the first sentence of Chapter 1 of her book, in which she asks, what makes America, America? The focus of the Tea Party is in deciding what is truly American and what is not. The answer is that liberals and progressives, typified by President Obama, are somehow not truly American. They hate America. They and their foreign ideas must be defeated, the Tea Party does. And we, the true and truly patriotic Americans, must take the country back from them who hate America. The Tea Party simply rallies around the Constitution as the source and embodiment of this national vision. To the Tea Party supporters, the Constitution is just the dividing line, separating the nation they love from all that threatens it. I disagree with the Tea Party on most issues, but the problem is they do not see my views as a legitimate part of the national debate. They do not merely believe programs to alleviate poverty and pollution are misguided. They believe that these programs are unconstitutional and un-American. In their vision of America, there's no place for people who espouse these alien, socialist, European ideas. And that's truly the objectionable part of the Tea Party movement. Its narrow vision of America seeks to exclude those who disagree with it as dangerously foreign. And that's the definition of a nationalist movement. It seeks to police and protect the nation's borders, both literally and figuratively, from what are perceived to be the nation's enemies, to keep these enemies and their alien ideas out. In this case, the enemy is me and other Americans who have different views about what is best for the country. Thank you again for letting me respond to your book, and I look forward to hearing what Elizabeth has to say now. Thanks, Jared. Uh, Jared said a lot of interesting things that I think are worth commenting about, and I think that he does a very able job of sort of laying out, I think, the sort of gut concerns that those who are on the political left have about the Tea Party movement, and also I think about the sort of the misunderstandings about what does motivate them. He started out his discussion with, again, painting them demographically and suggesting that their demographic composition is what's driving the things that come out of their mouth. But, you know, the polling data just doesn't bear this demographic portrayal out. If you look at the polling data, in fact, there was a a big one conducted by USA Today and Gallup in April of 2010, and that poll concluded, and I'll just quote it here, it said, quote, their age, educational background, employment status, and race – 
Tea partiers are quite representative of the public at large. And then if you break down the data, it shows that tea partiers are slightly more male, but only slightly, than the general population, slightly better economically than the general population, but again, only slightly. We're talking about 55% of tea partiers making more than $50,000 a year versus 50% of the general population. And then in terms of race, they have the exact same proportion of Hispanic and other races, which is 15%, as the general population. The one area I do think where there is a racial difference is when it comes to African Americans, where the Tea Party does seem to have a definite disadvantage, because only 6% of Tea Party or supporters self-identify themselves as African American, compared to 11% of the general population. But that shouldn't be surprising on some level because, again, the Tea Partiers are much less likely to consider themselves liberal than the general population. They self-identify as conservative or libertarian. And this seems to be the political self-identification of most of the African-American community. You look at just the raw statistics of the 2008 presidential election, and you had 95% of African-Americans voting for President Obama. And they still, at least according to polling data, have great loyalty to President Obama, and they give him much higher favorability ratings than the white population or Hispanic population. So it's wrong to start with that because the Tea Party is very representative of America. The Tea Party has supported many successful minority candidates, including Governor Susana Martinez of New Mexico, Nikki Haley of South Carolina, Senator Marco Rubio of Florida, Representative Alan West of Florida, et cetera, et cetera. We can talk about that all day. So this is not a movement about demographics. It's not driven by demographics. It's not what this is about. What it is about is anger over policies that the Tea Party opposes. So, for example, we look at the principle of limited government. Certainly one of the first things that got the Tea Party going was their opposition to the massive trillion-dollar bailouts that started toward the end of President Bush's administration and continued on through the Obama administration. So those bailouts clearly are not consonant with the concept of limited government, even by most progressives today, probably aren't real happy with their investment. And then we have the coup de grace, if you will, would be Obamacare or the health care reform law. It's hard to say with a straight face that you are progressive or you're left of center politically and that you embrace the concept of limited and enumerated power and support the health care reform law at the same time because the health care reform law has absolutely no limiting principle in it. If the Congress has the power through the Commerce Clause to force people to buy a private product like health insurance, There is no limit to federal power. It has become a leviathan, and clearly that is not the concept of limited enumerated power that the founding generation spilled its blood to resist. And we also look at, for example, the principle of originalism, where Professor Goldstein suggested that there was some sort of reverence of the founders as people rather than their principles, which is, again, not the case. The Tea Partiers embraced the political philosophy of the founding generation and the Enlightenment philosophy, and that philosophy does indeed endorse the idea of individual responsibility rather than government entitlement. So yes, there are going to be some differences about the size and scope of government between someone who embraces that philosophy of limited government versus someone who believes in government that is less limited and much more robust in terms of its entitlement programs. And when it comes to economic regulation, which is one of the last things that was mentioned, I believe, in the response, you can quote a particular justice all day about whether or not the Constitution embraces a certain type of idea of economic regulation. But you really can't debate, if you're familiar with the original sources, that the Constitution did, in fact, embrace a very specific political philosophy of individualism and free market-based economy. And in fact, that's why you see all the way up until basically 1937, when the New Deal Supreme Court changed its mind about things, that the very beginning of our constitutional construction suggested that there was, in fact, a free market in this country and that the power of the federal government to interfere with that market was rather limited, and it was limited because there was recognized that there was such a thing as liberty of or from contract. 
And of course, that phraseology, I think, is best exemplified by the Lochner decision, has been out of favor, again, since the New Deal court switch in time in 1937. But that doesn't make it right. And in fact, the modern vision post-New Deal is a lot younger in terms of constitutional pedigree than the liberty of contract philosophy that was understood and taken for granted during the first 100 plus years of our country. So uh, Obamacare, for example, is the perfect poster child for this. Think about what Obamacare is doing. Obamacare is telling to each of us that we must buy a private product, that we must engage in a contractual relationship against our will with an insurance company for the rest of our lives or face government-imposed penalties. That kind of exercise of government power would be absolutely unknown to anyone in the founding generation, even as ardent a federalist as someone like Alexander Hamilton. So we have come a very long way since the founding understandings and the founding political philosophy. And the Tea Party understands it. It doesn't take a PhD. It doesn't take a law degree to understand how far we've drifted from the original design. And this is exactly what's motivating the Tea Party movement. So it's fun to have discussions about whether the original philosophy of individualism is better than the progressive philosophy of government entitlement. But let's have that debate rather than distracting ourselves with discussions about demographics and whose heart is in the right place and who's a nice person and who's not, because that's not going to get us anywhere. That's only going to further politically polarize this country, and we don't need that. I would be happy if we had more time to debate the constitutionality of the Health Care Reform Act, that is the Affordable Care Act, or the, whether the switch in time in 1937 was a good thing or whether freedom of contract is a good thing. All of these, I think, are legitimate places for debate. And, and I have no fault in you know, the Tea Party movement or in the originalists espousing their views and seeking in original sources what they consider to be the correct views. My strongest concern is that they don't want to have this debate. That is, they want to exclude from the debate a whole set of concerns that is everything starting from the progressive movement through the New Deal to today as being un-American and outside, you know, beyond the pale of appropriate American politics. That's the part of the movement that I object to. I disagree with their views about the about what the Constitution means, but I, I don't I find it unobjectionable that they hold different views. But it's that the movement that they make to say the people who disagree with them are un American and foreign, and we, and we, we, the true Americans, you know, defeat them to take back the country. That's the move that I, I object to. And it's not so much, I think, that Elizabeth takes the Tea Party movement at its word, that they understand the founders, but I think that they're simply just projecting onto the founders their own existing views. And that's the danger of originalism, that it gives people a language to talk as if you were talking an objective truth about what the document meant, when you're actually talking about your own values through this subject. But, but again, thank you for organizing this debate, and I think it's been very interesting. I think that Jared makes an interesting point. I do think it's misconstrued. It's taken out of context. I've spent a, a good deal of time with individual Tea Party groups. Not that I consider myself a card-carrying Tea Party or because no such thing exists, but to the extent that I've discerned an embrace of these constitutional principles, I certainly would be sympathetic to them. And my impression from spending some time with them is that they do, in fact, understand the difference, for example, between the Social Security and Medicare and the individual mandate in the health care reform law because they realize that Social Security and Medicare are exercises of the power to tax and spend. They actually know what the power to tax and spend is because they read it in the Constitution. And when they do express some disagreements with Social Security and Medicare, which I have heard, it is on the basis that they don't think the money is well spent or they think that the, the way the systems are set up is sort of like Ponzi scheme-like and they're doomed financially to fail. And so they would like to have policy changes so that either they substantially shrink in size or they're reformed in the way that they're carried out. So, but their objections at the end of the day about Social Security and Medicare – are those policy objections about how big the program should be and how they're set up for the future and not constitutional objections. 
So they actually understand that difference, which is something, frankly, I think most Americans don't understand. When you hear most Americans talking about the health care law, for example, one of the first things out of their mouth will be, well, why can't we have the health care reform law when we have Social Security and Medicare? They don't understand that the two laws are based on fundamentally different power sources within the enumerations of Article I, Section 8 of the Constitution, and that they are analyzed in a very distinct way because of that. So the Tea Partiers have a level of sophistication about the Constitution that I think is refreshing. I think it's long overdue. I think this country would be better off if more people had that level of sophistication and curiosity about their own Constitution. And I want to encourage more of that. In fact, I think more Americans need to start picking up some of these materials and reading them. And I hope that people who even hate the Tea Party will read my book, so at least they will have some exposure to those foundational principles. But I think that Jared and I are sort of great articulators of the different perspectives that even exist at high intellectual levels in this country, that you have a group of people who still believe that the political philosophy, the philosophy of government that animated the founding generation is still the best philosophy of government and will lead to more Americans being better off than the sort of more modern political philosophy or vision of government, which really had its genesis in the New Deal. And we can have that debate because there are reasonable disagreements about which one will lead to better results. But that's the high-level discourse that needs to take place, and it shouldn't just be people like Jared and I and members of the Federalist Society who can listen to that and understand it, but every American should be able to listen to it and actually understand what it is we're debating about. So with that in mind, I would just like to say thank you very much again for allowing us to debate these broader issues. I hope it spawns some discussion amongst lawyers and non-lawyers around the country and that it won't be the first time that Jared and I get to get to have this debate. So thank you very much. Thank you for listening to this Faculty Book Podcast. For more podcasts, as well as audio and video of past Federalist Society events, please visit our website at www.federalist.com. Federalist Society dot org forward slash multimedia.